Hi, and welcome back to Reflect Forward. I'm your host, Carrie Siggins. I'm so glad you are here today. Today, my guest is Sally Loftus. Sally is the managing director and founder of Loftus Partners, which is a 100% woman-owned human resources consulting, consulting firm. And she works to create workplaces where humans feel valued through living wages, through healthy human connections, through smart benefits, and feeling like it's an equitable environment. I love this conversation with Sally. She is on top of her game. She understands compensation, pay equity, pay quality better than anyone I've ever spoken to. And we have a fantastic conversation. And I know that you're going to get a lot out of this. So hang tight and I'll be right back with Sally. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I have Sally Loftus with me. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. All right. So tell us a little bit about your firm, what you do. I'd love to hear it in your own words. Thank you. I am the managing director at Loftus Partners, which we are a human resources consulting firm, which really specializes in people strategy and also in pay equity. So that's kind of what I've done my grad school research on, have worked on the last decade, and really work a lot with the organizations around their compensation structures. And so you started this, your company, you started your firm in the pandemic. So maybe talk a little bit about what that was like. Yeah, that's funny. I was writing our origin story earlier for a blog post. Yeah, I started in August 2020. And at the time, really, I was going to start in February 2020. And, you know, kind of was like, I don't think this pandemic's going well. This might not be the time. And then my children came home and stayed and, you know, waited until kind of August at that point had realized I already felt comfortable with virtual work and then people were opting more into it. But even starting in August 2020, we were months away from a vaccine here in the U.S. So really at that time I was doing 100% virtual work, but we made it work and I still do tons of virtual work. I mean, I do in-person stuff as well, but a lot of it is just working sessions together and building conversations around people positive approaches. Yeah, and I love that. I want to dive into that a little bit more. But first, just because I interview so many entrepreneurs on here, mm -hmm. what sparked you to want to do this and go out on your own? What was that driving factor for you? Yeah, it's funny. I had always thought I would love to do that. And at what point in my career I had worked at a consulting firm? But I really wanted to work for myself. And honestly, I just didn't have the confidence in myself in the beginning. And I kind of went back to school to get my graduate degree later, like in my 40s, and realized in that program, oh, wait, I think I can do this. I can do this because of the opportunities we had to work with clients as consultants and the peers I had and seeing what they were doing. So I, I had was ready to kind of end my position at a previous nonprofit and then kind of didn't really know what I wanted to do because human resources is like really big. And so it took me a while of doing some volunteer stuff to really figure out which parts of human resources I wanted to do on a long-term basis because I'd done all of it. But that was really going to give me joy, but also I could do some really effective work with clients. And so that really just all culminated in like this pay equity, compensation structures, alongside a time when that also became a topic, a really hot topic. So it worked out well. Yeah. So before we dive into all of that, I want to mm -hmm. just pull on this thread a little bit. You didn't have the self-confidence. And isn't mm -hmm. it interesting when you invest in yourself that you could see that you did have the, cap the capacity and the capability to do that? Can you talk a little bit more about how you overcame those self-confidence issues and maybe what that investment in yourself really helped you see about yourself? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question because it was something I didn't realize until, so for me specifically going back to grad school, and I was like in this cohort program that was hybrid. And so we had 30 people in our cohort. So a couple of things happened and that really kind of reflected this big light, I think, on me in ways I hadn't had before. One is that I realized that the kind of feedback I got in that program was the most meaningful feedback I had ever gotten in my career. And I think as a leader, the higher up you go in an organization, I think the less meaningful feedback you get. You get a lot of criticism and you get people wanting to be in your office or whatever. But like this was, you know, really structured, helpful feedback on how I showed up in relationships, how I showed up with presentation skills, things like that. 
The other piece was there were several women who had been in the program who were professors, who were mentors in our cohort, who literally pulled me aside and said, and this goes with the feedback, Sally, you're turning your volume down as a woman. You need to turn it way up. And you're not in a program where you need to turn yourself down. And so I had never had a woman speak that way to me. And then having it happen over and over again from these women who I looked up to and was like, okay. And they were like, you need to step into your power and just go for it. I was like, okay, let's do it. Oh my gosh, I love that. I tell that to so many people right now. This is such a crazy time on this planet. We should just go for it. Whatever you want to do, don't let those inner doubts and that inner negative self-talk hold you back or worrying about what other people are going to think about you. Just go for it. So I'm really glad you said that. And so what was that first step like of, okay, I'm going to do it? <laughs> yeah, whew, there were so many first steps. I think one was obviously there's a financial risk going out on your own. So that was something within our family we had figured out and had the ability to take that risk because I didn't have to replace my insurance immediately. But and I started really just asking people I knew who were in consulting. And a couple of things that people told me, one is that one of these mentors who had spoken to me in my graduate school program was like, you need to be meeting with like one to two people every week and just asking them what's working for them, what are they doing? And because it's easy when you go out on your own to be isolated, especially in the pandemic. And so she was like, you just need, so I just started looking at my network and just really building. So that was really important. And I try to keep up that practice today. It's not one to two per week. It's probably like one to two per month. But that was helpful. And then the other piece was I did some volunteering, virtual volunteering with organizations, again, like I said, to figure out what parts of human resources that were really meaningful for me, but also to get instant feedback from people who at the end of an hour long coaching session with them, they can be like, this is what I heard. This is what I'm going to take back. And so that enabled me to say, okay, I'm hearing, these are the things I'm consistently hearing in these sessions. So that's kind of the way I'm showing up and how I can present myself. Yeah, that's really great. I ask that question a lot of entrepreneurs and activating your network. I mean, that's not something that a lot of people say, but it's so incredibly important. So I moved to Durango from Austin, Texas about 16 years ago, almost 17 years ago. And I was young and dumb and a mess. But one of the things that I did was I reached out to 30 business owners, 30 people in Durango. They had no idea who I was. I convinced, I don't know, 15, 16, 18 of them or so to meet with me and, and just tried to figure out how to activate that network. And it was really powerful and it paid off. One of the gentlemen who I met with happened to be on the board of directors for Stone Age. And he could tell them like, yeah, you should interview her, even though she's young and doesn't have the experience that we're looking for. Activating your network is such an important aspect of starting a business and building a business. And so I'm really glad that you said that because I don't think that people maybe necessarily give it as much credit as they should or maybe take advantage of their network as much as they should. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that and bringing that forward because I think even when we hear the term network or like networking, we think of these people in business suits with their business card at a lunch and it's all boring. And so people don't see it as authentic. Yeah. anymore. And I really feel like that is like the most important part of my work is being connected into a network because collectively we do better work together. So if I'm not talking to people or connecting with them, then I'm losing out on part of my work because I'm, I myself, while I want to believe I can do everything by myself, it is not true. <laughs> And we shouldn't have to. When we do everything ourselves, we finally burn out and get resentful. And we don't want that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have a great podcast about burnout. I listen to that one too. It was super good. I know I'm going to do one about resentment when you like, like you think that you're the person who has to do it all. And then all of a sudden you become mm -hmm. resentful. That's going to be, that, that one's coming up here shortly too, because I hear it from a lot of people, especially people who are solopreneurs or in really small companies. And part of that is growing a company is that you do have to be that person, but eventually you get tired of it, right? And you're like, I want to be able to hand it. I might be able to do it, but I don't want to. <laughs> and so how do I start delegating effectively as you're growing as a leader and growing your business? And it can, it can cause some resentment sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I did everything by myself the first year and then decided, okay, I'm a super social person and I don't want to do any more projects by myself. And I don't want to have to be worried about supporting somebody else's livelihood 
on a full-time basis. So I decided that I was going to always work in a team environment on projects. And so I'd bring in people like, I would hire them purely as thought leaders just to talk to me offline from clients, just to talk through a project, just to be like, what are you hearing in this? Or they might review focus group feedback, obviously under contractual confidentiality. And it really helped me because I didn't feel that personal pressure. Like I felt like I could, one, I didn't have kind of those blind spots by being just me, but I could go on vacation and breathe. Even though I'm not like sitting with the keys to the world or anything and consulting, but like even just you want to be there and be supportive of your clients. But when you are the only one, it's hard to be like, hey, I'm taking the day off when they text Uh you with a difficult HR issue. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, that's smart. Again, activating that network. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So let's talk a little bit about your expertise, pay equity and pay transparency. So Mm -hmm. for those people who maybe aren't familiar with it, like Colorado is a pay transparency state. I know Mm -hmm. New York just became one. Colorado was Mm -hmm. first. There's several others out there. Could you maybe explain what pay transparency and pay equity are? Yeah, definitely. I will say it's it's a topic that continues to develop and It's learning a shared language because it is evolving so quickly. I see more and more states, cities, and territories will probably come online with pay transparency. So it's important to know. So let me start with pay transparency. Typically is a law passed by state, local government that requires an employer, and typically it's about a certain size, a number of employees, or maybe organization budget, to post the salary ranges for job openings. So that's typically what pay transparency is from a compliance standpoint. What I have found in my own work, which I'll talk about pay equity in a minute, but pay transparency, just doing it from a legal compliance standpoint, really closes the door on an opportunity to have incredible conversations with your employees. Because once somebody sees what somebody else makes and you've not told them, you've lost trust as an employer, right? And not saying you got to publish everybody's salaries to everybody, but at least having ranges, bands where people can see what's happening. So it's not somebody from outside of the company telling them information. So that's where I typically work is doing more than the legal compliance, but really thinking about how do you cascade this transparency throughout the organization? And that leads into pay equity. So pay equity, the way I define it, which is pay equity and kind of pay parity, which are together, which are people making the same for the same jobs, but also people making the same money throughout your organization that may not be based on gender, race, ethnicity, things like that. Yep. When Colorado enacted their pay transparency laws, there was all kinds of hoopla about it. And actually, we were interviewed, I think in Time magazine. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Time uh, and it was a woman wanting to know because New York was getting ready to pass this law and she wanted to understand how Colorado businesses looked at it. And I told her, look, I was a little bit worried about it too, because it's a change and it's not something that we've done. But what I had found is that it just makes it so much easier to have conversations. One with candidates about expectations, right? Not knowing what the salary is, you, know, you can get all the way to the finish line and then have too big of a gap that you can't overcome. And it's hard for a candidate to not understand exactly at least a range of what they're going to be paid within so that they can decide, is this an opportunity I even want to pursue? And and so I just appreciate it because it just gets it all out there on the open. And it just makes those types of conversations so much easier. In fact, one of the very first questions we ask when we're interviewing people is, did you review the salary? (laughs) And are you okay with this range? Because if you're not, then you know, let's not even start. Or if you're concerned about it, let's talk about those concerns before we get too far down the road. And and so that's, I think, one of the benefits. Also, just having more open conversations with your employees and having people understand where they stand and what what salary growth, what compensation growth can look like for them with the various career tracks they can take is extremely helpful in building a strong culture. So I just haven't looked at it as a negative thing. It just has not been a huge impact on us at all. And maybe other organizations don't feel the same way, but I just appreciate the transparent communication that it has forced everyone to have. Yeah, those are great examples. And I'm glad you had a great experience. And that probably shows a lot about your company, which I've read about in your employee stock ownership plan. That's really unique and amazing. I will say what I run into with organizations that struggle with this. One is that 
they have not been keeping up with the cost of living right. over the years. And it's not just, obviously, cost of living has been way out of whack in the United States for the last three years, but they haven't been catching up with it for like a decade. So they're caught with, oh my gosh, I've got to raise all the salaries. And pretty much you do to attract and retain talent. And I'll work with organizations on if they can't do it all within one fiscal year, let's work on a plan to get there. The other piece is that, like you said, there are some costs within a company that we don't really track, right? Time to hire. That's usually an HR metric. And what happens whenever you're investing all this time in a candidate, and like you said, they get down to the end and you can't close the gap, or maybe you decide to, and then it throws everybody else off in the organization because you're paying this person out of that because you're, you want to keep this person. So that's some pieces, like you were saying, you're feeling kind of some of the efficiency. And it's also a trust building practice with the candidate because you're just being honest. You're saying, hey, this is, this is what we're going to pay. Are you comfortable with it? Versus them coming down to a final interview and then finding out the pay is so much lower. How betrayed would you feel yeah. if that was your experience? So you want to start building trust from the very first moment somebody's interacting with your company. Yep. Agreed. And so some of those companies that had to go make some pretty big corrections mm -hmm. because they hadn't been keeping up with cost of living and they were out of whack. How do you help them get over this? Oh my gosh, how do I absorb this from a financial impact perspective? How do I talk to my employees about it so they aren't like, what the heck, you've been underpaying me for decades? <laughs> yes, yes and yes. Those are all situations I've encountered. <laughs> Usually I'll sit down, we'll start with a pay equity assessment where we basically are looking at everybody's, we're looking at the HR data, which is salaries, role, department, race, ethnicity, gender, age, tenure, things like that. And we'll look at it and just start saying, okay, what's going on? Do we see anything when you kind of line up? I'll say salary bands, but categories of jobs. Do we see anything that seems kind of really out of whack? And so we'll start there and then we'll start asking kind of questions. We always approach it with a sense of curiosity, not judgment, because more than likely most people have, have inherited a compensation system that they did not create. So there's going to be some things that happened in the past that you just have got to roll with. But we'll start there and just start looking. And what happens is it's almost like a thread when you're pulling out a sweater. You start pulling that thread and seeing things unravel. Oh, we were paying this person in finance so much more because that was a really difficult job to find 10 years ago or five years ago. But now, you know, we're going to, we need to probably do a salary study on that position and see, is that true? Is that a job that, you know, it's pretty easy to find candidates We'll look at recruitment practices. Really, it kind of pulls into the whole employee life cycle. When we start looking at tenure, are the lowest people paid the people with the shortest tenure? Well, that's interesting. Let's start digging into that. Do you know why they're leaving? Do you have an exit interview process? There's a lot of different ways you can go with the data. And we just start where the client has energy and resource to address it. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I'm sure it can be overwhelming for, for some leaders to go, okay, now I have to do this. What is that advice that you have for leaders who are like, okay, I am feeling overwhelmed by all of this? Yeah. You know, I try to be pretty honest and say, if you don't do anything, then nothing's ever going to happen. I certainly run into people who are like, we're not going to do anything. And, but usually I'll just say, okay, let's just, let's do this with intention and process. What I've seen in the last three years not necessarily with my clients, but in other ways is that usually the hourly or that entry tier of workers, that pay's gone up quite a bit, which it needed to anyway, to catch up with cost of living. And then like people who make, I'm going to say like over 300,000, those jobs have gone up significantly, but there's like this pinch happening between, I'm going to say 75,000 to 300,000 or whatever. And that's where the labor market is, is tightest right now. Yeah. So we'll say, okay, if you're going to, if you need to raise the entry level, let's make sure and raise everybody else at the same rate so that you're not continuing to create salary compression in the middle. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It totally, okay. makes, totally makes sense. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that doesn't surprise me. I haven't heard it put that way, but yeah, I think it, it totally makes sense. You've got those mid-range jobs, right? Or mid-management, high-level individual contributor roles. Mm -hmm. 
And maybe the people who've been there with some tenure who can sometimes maybe get the loyalty penalty where they've been yeah. with them for a while and haven't gotten it. So I can see where that group can come in and maybe get that pinch quite regularly. Yeah, there was research that just came out recently, and I can't remember who put it out there. I feel like it was Gallup, but that basically in the last year, people who left their company got a 7.6% raise, and the people who stayed at their company got a 5.2% raise. Obviously, that gap can be greater depending on what industry you're in. You're like, why wouldn't somebody go make mo more money? I think it comes down to the culture. And mm -hmm. how big of a role does a culture, does culture play into this when you're looking at it through the lens of pay equity and whether people want to stay or not. Yes, you hit the nail on the head. Absolutely. Is that when you look at research, typically people will say, I'm leaving my job because of pay. Number two will be because of my supervisor. Yeah. Which is a culture piece. So people will say, I have a toxic supervisor, or just bad management. And so there's got to be a real intention at multiple levels within an organization. It's training your supervisors. What's the approach? Do you have a people positive approach? A lot of our business practices are rooted in like manufacturing systems from the 1950s and 60s. And not that those aren't good, but I'm just saying the way we work now, we're much more kind of cognitive brain thought work versus like producing widgets. So what worked then is not going to work now. And so we've got to shift. And it's an employee's world now. I mean, it really is. And will that shift another way? I don't know. But we've really got to listen to our employees and hear what they say and implement the things they're looking for. That's really the most important thing. And that all goes down to having a culture that views people that way, that listens and supports people in that way. Yep, absolutely. Maybe a lot of people might have negative connotations with pay transparency. I don't want to share it or pay equity. Oh, this is a lot of work <laughs> and I'm going to have to pay people more. Let's flip that narrative mm -hmm. on its head. How can people, how can business leaders use pay transparency and pay equity? And maybe let's just look at compensation as a whole as a competitive advantage. Absolutely. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm taking notes because I'm like, these are great terms and thinking about what What is it that makes an advantage? So one thing is really thinking about how do you want to pay people? I work a lot with organizations in developing a compensation or pay philosophy. And previously, they might have one that's just basically, we want to pay at the 50% rate, or we want to pay at the 75 percentile and be the world's best employer. Great aspiration and not very tangible. So what does that even mean? So it's really working with those organizations to say, okay, what's our philosophy in the way we structure pay? I don't think there's one size fits all for every business. So that may look on look different based on what your mission and vision might be or the kind of industry you're in or whatever, but really documenting what's our approach to pay in people so that then you can start saying, okay, then how do we know we're achieving that philosophy? How do we know that we're, I use people positive a lot. How do we know we're using people positive management practices or things like that? So it's starting kind of those conversations now, which is what ends up happening when I do pay equity and pay transparency work is, you know, a lot of it is strategic conversations with people because they've never talked about it. So it's really even opening up the conversation about pay, which can be a huge first step. Yep, absolutely. We have, B, you mentioned Stone Age being an ESOP, and that's a really interesting conversation to have with people who are not familiar with it. And I definitely think it gives us a competitive advantage once people get it. And we also stop talking about it as a retirement benefit. That's mm -hmm. how you maximize it mm -hmm. is. You stay with the company for as long as it's working for you and working for the company. And then the closer retirement age, the better. And then, of course, if you leave before then, you roll it into an IRA to maximize it. But you can also mm -hmm. take it. It's your money. Mm -hmm. You can take the tax penalty. And people have left the company to go start at their own business. And so I'm going to take my ESOP money and go do that or buy a house or do things that, you know, that, that help them on their path to living their dreams, which we want people to do. But that was not an inspiring message, especially for Gen <laughs> Zers and young oh, yeah. millennials retirement. And so mm -hmm. we really talk about it as an ownership structure. And with most things in life, although most of us are about instant gratification, but most things in life, our investments grow over mm -hmm. time. We water them and we have the best ability to water our own investments here as employee owners. And so when we started talking about it that way, 
I think it resonated a lot more with younger people. And, and of course, some people, it resonates with retirement, right? I didn't think I was going to be able to retire at 65, and now I'm going to be able to. So it gives us this really unique competitive advantage, not only from a cultural perspective, but from a compensation perspective, too. How can people use equity to not only drive performance, drive compensation, but also to drive a culture of ownership thinking and people who care more than just about getting that paycheck? Yeah. And I want to say your ESOP plan is super interesting. And I think there are more and more companies who are going that way. And to your point, that's great to flip that narrative to say it's investing in the company, but it also requires a level of trust of your employees, but helping them understand that like the money's going into something they can directly impact versus the stock market, which I wish I could impact, but that's a very different way of thinking. But it's also, again, betting on yourself, which to me, is totally what the younger generations are coming up through. Like, I love the entrepreneurial spirits of the younger generation. I think that can be an advantage to saying, I can make a direct impact on the profit, which then puts money in my pocket. And there are some people who see things like some of these startup tech companies that go for big IPOs and get burned or whatever. Again, when you're in conversation with your employees and listening, you're building a competitive advantage because they're not feeling like they're a cog in the wheel. They're feeling like they're a dynamic human. And I certainly feel like I've listened to you enough, Carrie, to know that's the approach that you're taking with your organization. But that makes a huge difference with people because they want to feel seen and valued at work in many ways. And it's not just pay that you do that with. Yep, absolutely. And I agree. In fact, once people, once you get past the, uh, am I getting paid enough to take care of my needs? And yes, that I feel valued in my role. Most people don't look at that. I remember when I came to Stone Age, Um, I mentioned I was a mess. I was a complete mess. And all I cared about was I got a job and I can pay my bills. I realized now I looked at so much of my career as just being a paycheck player. Yes, I wanted to be successful. And yes, I wanted to achieve and make an impact. But it was very self-centered and very focused on what's in it for me. And when I came to work at Stone Age and I had autonomy and I had trust and and I was my, my talents were aligned with the job that I was doing, all of a sudden, like I never thought about my paycheck ever. And of course it was still important. Yes, I wanted to get salary growth, but it wasn't my main driver, right? My main driver was meaning, purpose, impact. And I think that not everybody is lucky enough to be able to have that in their job, in their company. Like I I know not everybody at Stone Age who works here is in the right role for them to be able to have those same exact feelings. My goal is that we can get everybody to that place because it is so freeing when you have it. And I think a lot of leaders, they just look at compensation or as like the main motivator, or they think it's so much work to figure out how to give that autonomy and be transparent that they don't do it. It's just not part of their culture, but they're missing out on what actually motivates people. And pay is not always the highest on the list. Yeah, you make a great point. One of my favorite exercises to work, like when I do employee feedback sessions or things like that, is just asking people, tell me all the things that motivate you. It doesn't have to be limited to work. And you get up there, you might have 10 people and have 200 things. One, it's super interesting because it's a way to learn about your employees. But two is you start seeing the themes, right? Maybe something relationship oriented. It may be something purpose oriented. It may be having autonomy. It may be having the ability to, you know, work a compressed schedule so you can go do stuff at night, whatever. And that's a really great way to just open up that dialogue and see what are the things that motivate people and how can you build a culture that surrounds? Absolutely. It's not easy to do, but it is so worth it. And I do think that a lot of people get overwhelmed with where do I get started? And I think the best place, and maybe you tell me if you agree, is start by asking your employees what they think. <laughs> Absolutely. I will say I'm amazed at how many organizations I work with that have no employee feedback loops okay. at all. They may have a annual survey and then don't even like really report out results or they may do nothing. So that's a great place to start is like, how do you build this two-way loop with your employees to give and receive feedback on a regular basis? Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, back to the pay equity question, mm-hmm. because I'm sure there are people here going, okay, great. No, I need to do this. It's probably a good idea. How much mm-hmm. is this going to cost me? And mm-hmm. is it just going to cost me something? Do I have an ability mm-hmm. to get a return on the investment that I make in hiring Sally to come in here and help me figure this out? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. I don't get asked that very much. So thank you for asking that. I will say one is that I will send in my links to you after this podcast. I have a blog post that's basically instructions on how to do a pay equity assessment yourself. So I think that should be open source to everybody on how to do this work. I'm happy to send that as a free resource to everyone. Two is that be in community with other people. Maybe if you see companies that were people there, if they're doing pay equity work, talk to them, see what's working for them. I've actually been part of a group for the last year. It was 10 global healthcare nonprofits who were all doing pay equity work and brought me in basically to facilitate their group that they met once a month. And it was like a community of practice. And we just talked about like, we had one session on just how do you communicate this to employees? We had one session on how do you calculate cost of living across continents? So we just talked about it and hammered it out and people shared resources. So that's another piece. And then obviously you can hire a consultant. There's different kind of levels of how much you want to go into it from just purely do an assessment. And here's what I would recommend. And typically an assessment is like a couple of months to, you know, a 12 month project where we're really digging in, doing focus groups, doing assessment of benefits, compensation, a salary study. I've done total rebuilds with people and that's Mm -hmm. usually like a 12 to 18 month process. And I serve as obviously a pay equity consultant, but also somewhat of a project manager in there because it's a lot of work on your HR people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The Mm -hmm. biggest benefit you're going to get from this is X, Y, Z. That's why you should do it. What would you what would you say that is? The biggest benefit as an organizational leader, as an employee, as an HR person. I love it. Give me all three. Okay. Ooh, good question. Ah. I think as an organizational leader that you are seeing and valuing your employees. I think as an HR person, leader, whatever your position might be, is that you're gaining clarity and efficiency Uh in the work you do. I think as an employee, you have a clearer understanding of how your organization pays you, which helps you to trust them and invest in them more. I love it. Yeah, I can just see why you're so good at this. (laughs) Oh, well, thank you. I'm very passionate about this I can tell. I can tell. All right. My final question for you, Mm -hmm. my signature question. The name of this podcast is Reflect Forward. In the context of everything that we've been talking about, what does Reflect Forward mean to you? I love this question. And I will say Reflect Forward means to me taking a pause so that I can work better in the future. So for me, it's when I take times to reflect and slow down enough, I actually activate a better self. Ugh, it's so brilliant. I oh, literally, you. you just gave me goosebumps because that is exactly what I just did this weekend. I, I did it on my mountain bike. I have my best thoughts when I'm thinking mm-hmm. on my mountain bike. And but I was like, I'm just going to just pause. I'm just going to get everything else out. I'm going to read. I'm going to listen. And then I had all of these epiphanies and it gave me that time to reflect. And I've been here walking around Stone Age. <laughs> telling everybody about all my epiphanies. And they're like, wow, you must have had a lot of time to reflect this weekend. (laughs) It's like I did. I slowed down enough to like just actually have time to think. So anyway, that really resonated with me right now. So thank you you for sharing that. (laughs) Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, I'll include all your information in the show notes. But if someone wanted to connect with you, what's the easiest way for them to find you? Yeah, definitely. It's LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn, probably more so than I should be. also have a company page for Loftus Partners on LinkedIn as well. I have a LinkedIn newsletter called Fully Human Resources, which is all about people positive practices. We have our website, loftuspartners.com. So there are a lot of ways to find me. I encourage you to sign up for my monthly newsletter where I share like maybe where I'm speaking or do, I, I do free trainings throughout the year, things like that. And I share that through the newsletter. Wonderful. I will include all that in the show notes. But you did just spark one more question because you've said it multiple times and I keep mm-hmm. saying I'm going to ask her about that. People positive practices. Mm-hmm. Tell, tell me where that came from and what it means. Yeah, it came from a couple of things. One is that research I did in my grad school program about the different management practices and then also the book Brave New Work by Aaron Dignan, which is a great read. And he talks a lot about the change from that manufacturing industry 
approach to management and really being people centric. But you think about from human centered design, things like that is really changing of how can we center people in the work we do and not about efficiency and productivity, but about meaning. And what I love they do. it. I love it. And I love that word. I use people centric all the time, but people positive. I love that. It just has such a great ring. So do you mind if I use it? <laughs> of course. Anytime. I wish I could say I termed it, but I did. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'm still going to give you credit for introducing it to me because I have not heard it before and I love it. I think, I think it's much more inclusive feeling than people centric. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Sally, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you about this. Very interesting topic. I've never had anybody on the show to talk about pay equity and pay transparency. So I knew mm -hmm. that this was going to be a fabulous conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Wonderful. All right, everyone, hang tight. I'll be right back. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed that interview. What great insight she provided us today. With that, I'll leave you for this week's episode of Reflect Forward. If you like this podcast, please go to your favorite podcasting platform, subscribe to it, write a review, share it with a friend. It always helps with the algorithms. I appreciate it so much. And if you are interested in checking out my new book, it is available for pre-order. I so appreciate the support. If you would be open to pre-ordering it, I would really appreciate it. You can go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble and just put in Carrie Siggins, the ownership mindset, and you'll be able to find it. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week.